in Daniel 9, verses 24 through 27, and you will need your Bible today. Seventy weeks are determined upon thy people and upon thy holy city to finish the transgression and to make an end of sins and to make reconciliation for iniquity and to bring in everlasting righteousness and to seal up the vision and prophecy and to anoint the most holy. Know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the commandment to restore and to build Jerusalem unto the Messiah the Prince shall be seven weeks. Now a week is seven days and each day represents a year, one year in this vision of the 70 weeks which God gave to Daniel. And three score and two weeks, that's 62 weeks, the streets will be built again and the wall even in troublous times, the tribulation. And after three score and two weeks shall Messiah be cut off, but not for himself. And the people of the prince that shall come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary, and the end thereof shall be with a flood. And unto the end of the war desolations are determined. And he shall confirm the covenant. He, the Antichrist, of whom we preached last week. He shall confirm the covenant with many, the Jewish people, for one week. That's seven years. And in the midst of the week, in the midst of the seven years, three and one half years into the tribulation, he shall cause the sacrifice and the oblation to cease. He will desecrate the temple and the holy place. And for the overspreading of abominations... Another name for the tribulation period. He shall make it desolate even until the consummation. And that determined shall be poured upon the desolate. A discouraged and despondent Job in the oldest book of the Bible once exclaimed in despair. Job 14 verses 1 and 2. Man that is born of woman is a few days and full of trouble. He cometh forth like a flower, and is cut down. He fleeth also as a shadow, and continueth not. Job's pessimistic description is tragically true. And the unsaved man knows that the way of the transgressor is especially hard. And apart from the grace of God, none of us could survive the trials and tribulations that beset humankind in a lifetime. Throughout his tortured and sinful history over the past 6,000 years of recorded times, mankind has been subjected to calamities, to disasters and plagues and pestilences and famines which have tracked him as a wolf would track a rabbit. But according to the Bible, there is coming a calamity, a short-lived one, unlike any which this weary world has ever, ever experienced. In just the early days of the tribulation period, which could begin today if the Lord Jesus were to come and rapture out his church today, in the early days of the tribulation, nearly one billion persons, one thousand million persons will be struck down. And then before the seven years of history, a majority of the earth's population numbering in excess of five billion will be killed. It will conclude with blood flowing in the streets up to the bridles of the horses for 200 miles. Now I'm glad to tell you that if you're a believer, if you've been born again, if you've gone to Calvary at some time in your life and believe that Jesus died for you, and was buried for you, and rose from the dead for you. And if you have received him into your heart as your Lord and your Savior, and the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ as the atonement for all your sins, you will not spend one moment in that seven-year period called the tribulation. A number of names, about 12 titles, have been given in Scripture for this seven-year period. Let me give you some of the names for this seven-year period, this this day, this time of tribulation. First of all, the day of the Lord. This title is used more frequently than any other title. For example, look at Isaiah 2, verse 12. Now, you need your pencil to write these, these locations down because time would never allow for me to read the many, many texts I will be giving you. 
So you write these down, search them later. Isaiah 2, verse 12. Isaiah 13, 6. Isaiah 13, verse 9. They all and many other references refer to the tribulation period as the day of the Lord. And then it's called the indignation in Isaiah 26, 20 and Isaiah 34, verse 2. It is called the day of God's vengeance in Isaiah 34, 8, Isaiah 63, verses 1 through 6. It is called the time of Jacob's trouble in Jeremiah 30 in verse 7. Jacob meaning Israel, the time of Israel's trouble. They've had trouble for thousands of years, but the wor worst is yet to come. It is called the overspreading of abominations in the text I read you a moment ago, Daniel 9, verse 27. It is referred to as the time of trouble such as never was. That's an exact quote from Daniel 12, 1. The time of trouble such as never was. That's how the King James Version describes the tribulation period. And God doesn't exaggerate. It is called the 70th week in Daniel's vision, 70-week vision, Daniel 9, 24 through 27. And that 70th week, seven days, represents the seven years of the tribulation. It is called the time of the end in Daniel 12 and verse 9, for in fact it is the end of the Gentile era. It is called the great day of his wrath in Revelation 6, 17. I said earlier, God does not exaggerate. Great day, it will be a great day. It is called the hour of his judgment in Revelation 14, verse 7. It is called the end of this world as we know it today, the end of this world in Matthew 13, verse 40, in Matthew 13, verse 49. And finally, the name most often used in popular terms for the seven-year period, it is called the tribulation. In Matthew 24, that's the Olivet Discourse, verse 21, and Matthew 24, verse 29. In Matthew 24, 21, Jesus said in the Olivet Discourse, For then shall be great tribulation, such as was not since the beginning of the world, to this time no, nor ever shall be. Now remember who's saying this. Jesus is saying this. Not some press agent, some, not some excited Bible scholar. This is Jesus saying, For then, those seven years, shall be great tribulation such as was not since the beginning of the world, to this time, the present, no nor ever shall be. Let me give you a few passages, direct quotes from Scripture, which aptly describe this seven years of tribulation. Turn to Isaiah 13, Isaiah chapter 13, and I'm going to read to you from verses 6, 7, 10, and 11. Isaiah 13, verses 6, 7, 10, and 11. Howl ye, for the day of the Lord is at hand. Therefore shall all hands be faint, and every man's heart shall melt. For the stars of heaven and the constellations thereof shall not give their light. The sun shall be darkened in his going forth, and the moon shall not cause her light to shine, and I will punish the world for their evil. What's the tribulation all about? I will punish the world for their evil. And this world has never been punished until God punishes it. Then look at Isaiah 2, verse 19. Isaiah 2, verse 19. And they shall go into the holes of the rocks, the people who are on the earth during the tribulation, and into the caves of the earth for fear of the Lord, when he ariseth to shake terribly the earth. Now turn to Isaiah 24. Isaiah chapter 24, verses 1, 19, and 20. Verses 1, 19, and 20. Behold, the Lord maketh the earth empty, and turneth it upside down. What does that mean? And scattereth abroad the inhabitants thereof. The earth is utterly broken down. The earth is clean dissolved. The earth is moved exceedingly. Now listen to this statement here. The earth shall reel to and fro like a drunkard. 
You've heard of earthquakes that on the seismic scale go up to seven and eight and nine. This one will go off the scales. The earth shall reel to and fro, not in certain geographical locations, but universally like a drunkard. Let's talk about the length of this tribulation period. While I will not bring, this is another sermon, I will not bring a sermon on Daniel's vision of the 70 weeks. If you will carefully study Daniel 9, 24 through 27, you will learn that the 70th week of Dan Daniel is the tribulation period and that this is a period of seven years duration. What is the purpose of the tribulation? Why is God doing such a thing? The purpose of the tribulation, why this terrible period? There are at least six reasons in the scriptures for the tribulation period. Remember, the tribulation period does not begin until the Lord raptures out the church first. If the trump were to sound today and the living and the dead in Christ would go up in a nanosecond to meet the Lord in the air to be with him, we would appear before the judgment seat of Christ. We would be with our Lord for these seven years. The tribulation period would then begin on the earth and play out for seven years. At the end of the seven years, our Lord Jesus will return in power and in great glory, not for his church, but with his church. We'll be with him, millions of us. And without firing a shot at the battle of Armageddon, our Lord will speak the word in just like that. Just like that, the war is over. There'll be such carnage at the Battle of Armageddon, we'll get there in a moment, that seven months into the kingdom age, the thousand-year reign of Christ on earth, seven months will be required to bury the dead of the Battle of Armageddon. Seven months. Now, you talk about trouble ahead. If you're not a Christian, if you don't know the Lord as your Savior, if you've never trusted him, you should not wait another day. You should receive him right now. You should get all your family inside. Everybody's wondering, where is it going? We're reaching a climax in a hurry. We're six years from the 21st century. I spoke to 180 debaters from 20 universities last night at Liberty University here for a debate tournament. And these are bright young men and young ladies. And I shared these truths with them. One young man stood and said, I am, I am gay, and he had across his shirt, call me faggot. He said, I sleep with a man, and nobody's going to tell me that I can't do that. Gently and lovingly, I shared with him what the Bible has to say, but I said, young man, there is somebody who will tell you you can't do that. Maybe not in this life, but there is somebody who will tell you you can't do that, and you won't do it anymore. It's wrong. The purpose of this tribulation, six reasons. Number one, to harvest the crop that has been sown throughout the ages by God, Satan, and mankind. In Matthew 13, our Lord Jesus preached an entire sermon on the parable of the sower. There's a principle that whatever you sow, you will reap. It doesn't matter if you're God, the devil, a human being, an angel. Sowing and reaping is an irrevocable principle of Scripture. And in Matthew 13, verses 37 through 43, please turn there, Matthew 13, verses 37 through 43, we see that the tribulation period will be a time of harvest. Everybody's going to harvest what they've sown. Beginning verse 37. He, Jesus speaking, He that soweth the good seed is the Son of Man. That's Christ. The field is the world. The good seed are the children of the kingdom. But the tares are the children of the wicked one. That's Satan. The enemy that sowed them is the devil. The harvest is the end of the world. And the reapers are the angels. As therefore the tares are gathered and burned in the fire, eternal damnation, so shall it be in the end of this world. The Son of Man shall send forth his angels, and they shall gather out of his kingdom all things that offend and them which do iniquity, and shall cast them into a furnace of fire. There shall be wailing and gnashing of teeth. Then shall the righteous shine forth as the sun in the kingdom of their father. A second reason for the tribulation, 
to prove the falseness of the devil's claim. Ever since Satan was kicked out of heaven, Isaiah 14, Satan has been attempting to convince a skeptical world that he, rather than the Lord Jesus Christ, should be ruling the universe. That's what the whole battle is about, the controversies between Satan and Christ. Satan says, I am lifted up. I will rule the world. I should be in charge. And therefore, during the tribulation period, the sovereign God will give Satan a free and unhindered hand to do anything he wants to make his boast good. But having read the last chapter, it doesn't come out so well for him. There's a third reason for the tribulation, to prepare a great martyred multitude for heaven. There will be multitudes who will be killed during the tribulation period for refusing the mark of the beast. We're entering a cashless society right now. There will be no cash during the tribulation. We already will be there. You will buy and sell according to the revelation only if you have the mark of the beast in your forehead or the palm of your right hand. And if you do not have the number, if you do not have an allegiance to the Antichrist, the beast, the false prophet, if you're not committed to Satan, you cannot buy food to eat, clothing to wear, and millions will refuse the mark and will be martyred, killed, but thank God, saved during the tribulation. In Revelation 7, verses 9 and 14, turn there, Revelation 7, verses 9 and 14. After this, John said, I beheld, and lo, a great multitude, which no man could number of all nations and kindreds and people and tongues, stood before the throne. These are they, verse 9, 14, these are they which came out of great tribulation and have washed their robes and made them white in what? In the blood of the Lamb. There's never been salvation in anything else but the blood of the Lamb. And then to prepare a great living multitude for the millennium, there's a tribulation period. Matthew 25, if you'll turn to Matthew's Gospel 25, verses 32 through 34. And before him shall be gathered all nations before our Lord. And he shall separate them one nation from another, as a shepherd divideth his sheep from the goats. And he shall set the sheep on his right hand, but the goats on the left. Then shall the king say unto them on his right hand, Come, ye blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. Next week I'm going to be talking about that millennium. There will be a lot of people on the earth, unsaved people, who will go out of the tribulation right into the kingdom age. Unsaved people who will live and die and give birth to children just like we do today. It is over that great multitude that the saints will rule and reign for a thousand years. What a difference there. Here are the saints who cannot become ill, cannot die, uh, who have absolute authority. You don't have to lock your doors at night. No hospitals. You're not going to get sick. I mean, the saints are not going to. But the unsaved are very, very mortal. And they come out of the tribulation and populate the earth because in order for us to rule and reign with Christ, there must be someone to rule over. And these are they who provide the multi-millions during the kingdom age over which Christ shall rule with a rod of iron through his saints. And then the purpose of the tribulation period is to punish the Gentiles. Look at Romans chapter 1, verse 18. Romans 1, verse 18. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and, and unrighteousness of men. Move on back in the New Testament to 2 Thessalonians. 2 Thessalonians 2, verses 11 and 12. And for this cause God shall send them strong delusion that they should believe a lie, that they all might be damned who believe not the truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. Now to the last book of the Bible, Revelation 19, verse 15. Revelation 19, verse 15. And out of his mouth goeth a sharp sword, that with it he, our Lord, should smite the nations. And then to purge Israel. To purge Israel is one of the purposes of the tribulation. Ezekiel 20, verses 37 and 38. And I will cause you, Israel, to pass under the rod, and I will purge out from among you the rebels. Now turn to Zechariah. Go to the, 
to the end of the Old Testament and back up a book or two. Zechariah 13, verses 8 and 9. Zechariah 13, verses 8 and 9. And it shall come to pass that in all the land, saith the Lord, two parts therein shall be cut off and die, but the third shall be left therein, and I will bring the third part through the fire and will refine them as silver is refined and will try them as gold is tried. They shall call on my name. I will say it is my people, and they shall say the Lord is my God. Israel shall be saved in a day. Israel is in the land of Israel today in blindness. The people are in the land in blindness. They do not generally know the Christ who is our Messiah, our Savior. But in a day they will believe, millions of them, and will be saved. What a day. There are a lot of personalities appearing in the Great Tribulation. As in any drama or play, a number of actors will render their parts and say their lines during this Earth's most sobering drama. They would include a number. I'll just quote them to you and give you verses to search them. At the very end of the church age, just preparatory to going into the Tribulation, the Holy Spirit will play a great role. Joel 2.28 Verses 30 through 32 of Joel 2. And it shall come to pass after that I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, your old men shall dream dreams, your young men shall see visions, and I will show wonders. Here's the, uh, that's revival just before the coming of the Lord. And now here's uh, the beginning of the tribulation following the rapture. I will show wonders in the heavens and in the earth, blood and fire and pillars of smoke. The sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before the great and the terrible day of the Lord come. And it shall come to pass that whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Thank God. Delivered. For in Mount Zion and in Jerusalem shall be deliverance as the Lord hath said and in the remnant whom the Lord shall call. The devil will also play a role in the tribulation. Revelation 12 verse 12. Two special Old Testament witnesses, probably Moses and Elijah, will play a role. Revelation 11, verse 3, they'll preach for three and a half years before they're killed. The Antichrist, as we preached on last week, will play a role. 2 Thessalonians 2, verses 3, 4, and 9. The false prophet, Revelation 13, verse 11. A multitude of specialized angels, Revelation 7, verse 2, Revelation 8, and verse 3. And then 144,000 Israelite preachers who will preach the gospel of the kingdom. They will all be killed, but they will preach, Revelation 7, 12,000 out of each of the 12 tribes of Israel, saved and called to preach, and what a, what a harvest they'll have. And then there'll be an army of locust-like demons from out of the bottomless pit that will do great damage to the human family, Revelation 9, verses 1 through 12. And then an army of horse and rider demons from the Euphrates River, numbering 200 million. I don't know what they'll look like. They're supernatural in being. But Revelation 9, verses 13 through 21 says they'll come up out of the Euphrates and do great injury to millions of people. Three evil spirits are described in Revelation 16, verses 13 and 14, with great wicked powers. And then a cruel, power-mad ruler from the north, Ezekiel 38, verse 2. That's the Gog and Magog. Just because Soviet communism is dead doesn't mean that God has changed the meaning of Old Testament prophecy. And then there'll be a persecuted woman, namely the nation of Israel. Revelation 12, verse 1. There'll be a vile harlot taking part there. Revelation 17, the first six verses. This is the false church. This, by the way, is not Roman Catholicism. Uh, solely. It is not uh, the, some cult or whatever. All apostate religions who deny the deity of Christ, the inspiration of Scripture, relationship with God through the crucified, buried, risen Savior will form that one world church. They met in Chicago the other day. They came from everywhere, from all kinds of backgrounds to sort of put it all together for the Antichrist. And then an arrogant queen, Revelation 18, verses 1 through 7. This is the one world government, the political and economic systems that are coming together right now. There is a one world government, one world church, one world supreme court, all in formative stages at this moment. 
Let me give you a suggested chronology of what's going to happen in the seven years of tribulation. Let's break it in three pieces. The first three and a half years first. In the first three and a half years, there will be a formal organization of the super harlot church according to Revelation 17. It's happening right now. It's called liberalism. It's called moderate. It's called uh, paganism, uh, new age religion, etc., etc. There will then be the appearance of the Antichrist and his false prophet in Revelation 13. And then the revival of the Roman Empire. It's in place right now. It's the United States of Europe, the European Economic Community. It's there right now. 380 million strong today in population. The Antichrist's seven-year covenant with Israel will be made in Daniel 9:27. You read that. Isaiah 28, 18. And then the pouring out of the first six seals of awful judgment, Revelation 6. And then the mass return of the Jews to Palestine in Ezekiel 37. The conversion and the call to preach to the 144,000 Israelite preachers, Revelation 7, verses 1 through 4. And then the rebuilding of the Jewish temple. It's happening right now, Daniel 9, 27. I believe there's evidence, and we are putting it together. Our producer at Old Time Gospel Hour has footage of tunnels underneath the old city where the rebuilding of the Jewish temple is being planned, if not right now, performed. Uh, and then the ministry of the two witnesses in Revelation 11, verses 3 through, thir 3 through 13. The middle part of the tribula uh, tribulation period, a brief undetermined period, is also significant. During that time, Gog and Magog will inv invade Palestine, Ezekiel 38 and 39. During that little period of days, the martyrdom of the two witnesses will take place. Revelation 11, verse 7 says the whole world will see those two preachers, fundamentalist preachers lying dead in the streets of the city. Now, how could the whole world see that except for today with television and satellite? The whole world can see anything happening anywhere. And that is exactly what will happen. They will be killed and laid dead in the street for three and a half days. And then they're going to get up. There's rejoicing and parties everywhere. Boy, we killed those fundamentals. We got rid of the religious right. We got those nuts out of the way. And then those two preachers stand up energized by God and go straight into heaven. And I wonder what they'll say about that at the country club. And then the martyrdom of the 144,000, they all die for preaching the gospel. And the casting out of Satan from heaven, Revelation 12, and the destruction of the false church. These liberals who think they're working with new age religion and boy, they've got their crowd together. The very antichrist whom they will worship will destroy them himself, himself. Revelation 17 and verse 16. The last three and a half years are called the Great Tribulation. Those who are here will see the full manifestation of Antichrist, Revelation 13. The worldwide persecution of Israel, Revelation 12, verse 13. The pouring out of the last sealed judgment, Revelation 8, verse 9. The messages of three special angels, Revelation 14, 6 through 12, and it's getting worse increasingly and exponentially worse with every uh, the succeeding judgment. The pouring out of the seven vials of judgment, Revelation 16, nothing like it in history. The sudden destruction of economic and political Babylon, Revelation 18, that's, that's when Antichrist destroys the one world government. He's already destroyed the one world church. He destroys the one world e economic system. And he becomes God. He takes over everybody and everything. And at that point in time, it looks absolutely hopeless. And then it gets worse. The climax of the tribulation. It's called the Battle of Armageddon. There's a verse in Revelation 16. I wish you'd turn there. I'm closing, but you've got to get this. Revelation 16 and verse 16. Remember, saints, we won't be here. We'll be up yonder with him. We'll be seeing all this happen, but we won't be here. But if you've got some unsaved loved ones, it ought to drive you out of this church today to take the gospel to them. It ought to drive you to your knees to pray for their salvation. Revelation 16, verse 16, And he, God, gathered them, that's the multitudes of the earth, all of the Antichrist remnant, he gathered them together into a place called, in the Hebrew tongue, Armageddon. I've been there. The ground area involved in Armageddon is unbelievably massive. It runs some 200 miles north and south and 100 miles east and west.
for a total of 20,000 square miles. This is where the last great war will be fought, the biggest, boldest, bloodiest, most brazen and blasphemous of all wars. When Saddam Hussein talked about the mother of all wars, he had no conception of what he was talking about. That will be fought in the Battle of Armageddon. There are two authors with, 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 with which I close today, two authors who aptly describe this battle for us. One of them is J.D. Pentecost in his book, Prophecy for Today. The other is Dr. Herman Hoyt in his book entitled, End Times. You should read both of them. Here's what Pentecost said. I'll just give a little excerpt describing the Battle of Armageddon. Listen to this. Palestine is to be given a bloodbath of unprecedented proportions which will flow from Armageddon at the north down through the valley of Jehoshaphat, will cover the land of Edom, and will wash over all Judea and the city of Jerusalem. John looks at, at this scene of carnage, and he describes it as blood flowing to the depths of horses' bridles. It is beyond human imagination to see a lake that size that has been drained from the veins of those who have followed the purposes of Satan to try to exterminate God's cho chosen people in order to prevent Jesus Christ from coming to reign, end quote. Listen to Hoyt. I quote, The Battle of Armageddon will result in wholesale carnage among the legions of the beast. The brilliance of Christ appearing will produce trembling and demoralization in the soldiers. Zechariah 12, verse 2, chapter 14, verse 13. The result of this demoralization and trembling will be the desertion from the Antichrist and the rendering of him inoperative. Second Thessalonians 2 verse 8. This tremendous light from heaven will produce astonishment and blindness in animals and madness in men. Zechariah 12 4. A plague will sweep through the armies from this light and men will not fight where they stand. Zechariah 14, verses 12 and 15. The blood of animals and men, listen, will form a lake 200 miles long and bridle deep. Revelation 14, verses 19 and 20. The stench of this rotting mass of flesh and blood will fill the entire region. Isaiah 34, verses 1, 2, and 3. The mangled forms of men and beasts will provide a feast for the carrion birds. Revelation 19, 17, 18, and 21. The beast and the false prophet will then be cast alive into the lake of fire forever. Revelation 19, 20, end of quote. I repeat, you won't be here for that if you know Christ as your Savior. If you don't know him, you ought to turn your life over to him. I'll read to you the bottom line application of my message today from what Simon Peter said in 2 Peter 3, verses 9 through 14, without comment. This is what God is saying to you if you're not ready, what you should do. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering to us, but not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in the which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. The earth also and the works that are therein shall be burned up. Seeing then that all these things shall be dissolved, what manner of persons ought ye to be in all holy conversation, that's behavior and godliness, looking for and hasting unto the coming of the day of God, wherein the heavens being on fire shall be dissolved and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. Nevertheless, we, according to his promise, look for new heavens and a new earth, wherein dwelleth righteousness. Wherefore, beloved, bottom line, seeing that ye look for such things, be diligent that ye may be found of him in peace, without spot, and blameless. Let us pray.